Greetings, guys. Uh, so in this video, we're going to talk about a technique called math scaling. Uh, and the idea is that when you run a meter designed to flow a lot of air to support, you know, a power adder application, uh, it's entirely possible that you will get to an airflow measurement that is so high, the factory computer can no longer calculate that. And you're going to run into this with, with all this uh, EEC4 stuff. And really, this is actually something you run into with almost any tuning system. I mean, at some point, the engineers only anticipated for there to be a, a reasonable maximum airflow that would ever come through an engine. So, you know, a lot of times there's going to be some sort of hard limitations you can't get around. So anyways, what we're focused on today is uh, Fox Body GUFB uh, strategies, but the same as something very similar to this would apply to a lot of others. So in that particular strategy, when you look at your mass airflow transfer, the magic number is 2350. Uh, this is just from the, the public information that's out there, uh, but I, I've observed that this is a pretty close limit. Sometimes it seems just a hair off, but very close to that. So what that means is if you actually flow that that much and the computer gets in here and sees a number that's higher than that, it freaks out. It doesn't know how to perform those calculations anymore, uh, and then bad things happen. So. If you have a math transfer that you plug in here and you notice that uh, in this case you're above 2350, we have to do something. And no, you can't just set all these numbers to 2350 and, and uh, be happy. Not necessarily. Um, if, if you're actually getting into these upper ranges when, when you drive the car, you still need tunability there. If you flatline it, you're going to go dead lean up top and you know it's, it's not going to work. So, so you can't just ditch those cells. So what we do is we, we do a technique called scaling. And the idea is that we can trick the computer very easily to cut these numbers down by whatever factor we want. Like we could cut them in half here even. Uh, and then after we do that, there's a few other settings throughout the tune we change so that the computer doesn't freak out and all of its internal balances still work. All the math still works. The calculations come out the same. Uh, and it's able to basically drive as though nothing had been changed. However, these numbers will technically be half of what they were, so you're no longer going to hit that limit. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to take all of these numbers in this column, and we're going to divide them by two. We're just, to make this video simple, we're just going to, the goal is to cut everything in half. So divide by two, go back up to the top, and you can see now 1473 is going to be the, you know, the highest number we have. So We've effectively fixed that problem that we would have encountered, but now that the tune is going to be all jacked up. So if we stopped here and did nothing else, the result would be you would get half the fuel that you normally would with, with the, the correct, the real values in from the transfer. Um, because these airflow numbers have a, a direct correlation to fueling. The more air you get, the more fuel you need. So regardless of what that desired air to fuel ratio is at any given point uh, that the computer is looking for, it still is going to run that math. And if these numbers are ha half of what they should be, you're going to get about half the fuel and it's not going to work. The second thing that's going to be real messed up if we don't do anything else is uh, the load measurements will be way off. So, so load uh, is basically how your spark is calculated while you're driving the car, what your timing is at any given point. And load is used uh, in a kind of a derivative. Uh, there's a derivative created from that called per load or load X, uh, and that's what controls ultimately your, your base fuel table that determines what's your target air to fuel ratio, um, you know, and under different conditions. So that's, that's a really important thing. So basically by cutting these numbers in half, we will effectively cut load in half also, which will lead to increased timing actually is what will happen, uh, because if you're at lower loads, you can have more timing because you're not working the engine as hard. So you'd have a lot more timing than you probably should. And then secondly, your fuel would think also that you're not really heavy loads, so you'd be running lean. Um, the target air to fuel ratio would be substantially leaner. In fact, it would probably be close to stoic around 14.6 and uh, you know, just wouldn't really be good for you. So how do we fix all this stuff? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to fix the load calculation because if we fix load, per load should theoretically be fixed without doing anything else. So load is really only a factor of, as far as the tune is concerned, two numbers. The ones here, the, the transfer function. So what is my airflow at a given point? And then the second one is what is the cubic inches of my motor? So think about it this way. A 300 cubic inch engine getting to this much airflow 
is what it is. If I had a 600 cubic inch big block that was way, way bigger, and this was the same amount of air it was producing, you would argue that that really big engine is not working very hard. It should have way more potential in it. So that's kind of the way you can think about load. So as cubic inches uh, increase, same airflow would have a lower load. So what we're going to do here is now that we've cut these numbers in half, we're going to jump over to uh, we're going to jump over to the system area scalars, and right here there is a system engine displacement. So this is your cubic inches. So if if we're going to run with these uh, you know these airflow numbers cut in half, then we need to cut our cubic inches in half also. So divide by two, and that's that. Okay, so that's going to fix our load measurements. So that's that's another positive step in the right direction. Uh, load should be exactly the same now, and therefore our per load will also be the same. So we fix those problems. Now, the next major problem is your fuel injector. So if we're tricking the computer to think that it's getting half of the air that it normally is, then we would also need to tell it that you have half the fuel injector size that you have, or else it's going to be uh, have increased pulse width and it's not going to make any sense. So what we need to do now is we go to the uh, fuel section. We'll go under fuel injector and we'll get to our high slope and low slope. Now, uh, the, the goal here is that we're going to have to, to divide all of this stuff as well. So we should be able to come in here, divide by two, and you're also going to need to reduce your injector breakpoint uh, by the same amount. So you'll want to take these values and divide by two also. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the breakpoint and where you put these two slope numbers, and so if that relationship changes, uh, you're, you're not going to get what you need. Uh, this also comes up to sometimes guys ask if we need to go ahead and cut this number. The answer is no. Uh, you don't need to change this because this is these numbers here are talking about an actual pulse width change measured in milliseconds. We're doing a bunch of math trickery behind the scenes, but ultimately we need the same amount of fuel under all the normal conditions. So because this is just directly talking about pulse width, we do not change these numbers. Uh, another thing that comes up sometimes is people asking about your, your cranking pulse width because the, the cranking pulse width uh, of your injector is just determined by this table just outright. There's, it doesn't read your mass air meter, doesn't care what size injector you say you have. It just has a hard-coded injector pulse width. So if you have this data correct for your application, then you don't change this. You, if you cut this in half, like everything else, you're not going to get enough fuel to your engine. It probably won't start. So, uh, so you leave this number alone also. <clears throat> so from a fuel injector perspective, uh, that should solve that problem. So now we've got the airflow cut down, so we're not going to hit the limit on the computer. We've got the cubic inches lowered, so our load measurements are going to come out the same. Therefore, our per load measurements are going to come out the same. And we've told the injectors uh, that they're a different size as well so that we don't have uh, an improper fueling situation. Now, the last thing we have to do is if we're pretending like this engine has half the cubic inches that it normally does, then there's we have to basically tell it that anything that's air related or, or uh, displacement related is, is cut in half as well. And so the, the place that that lives in this particular strategy uh, is when you go into this, um, I'm sorry, you go into fuel uh, and then you go to transient enrichment and we get into here. And there's these two numbers right here that I want to bring to your attention. So what we're really talking about is, you know, the, the transient enrichment fuel in these strategies is um, it's built around the concept of how much air volume is in the manifold. What are the cubic inches of my engine? Uh, and then there's, you know, some other factors that go into it. But that manifold volume, how much air is already inside the manifold before you even crack the throttle open? It uses this as a way to determine is the manifold, you know, filling uh, or is it not filling? Uh, and, and this has a lot to do with your transient enrichment. So what I want to show you something, and this is why I love this software so much, you know, when you, when you click on a parameter, you look down at the bottom and it gives you some understanding of what this thing is. So this is kind of a formula that's telling you, you know, where would you want to put this? And they're saying this value should be equal to, and they've got a formula. So load number, what? well, load numbers aren't going to change. So nothing here is different divided by 100, 100 doesn't change, times engine displacement. Now, right now, that means we have a problem because 
we've cut our engine displacement in half, therefore we would have to cut this number in half uh, for things to be the same. So that's important. Um, and then the manifold volume uh, we have not changed and the number of cylinders we have not changed. So if we cut engine displacement in half, then what we need to do here is cut this number in half. And when we go down to uh, the slow filter constant, you, you see that it's basically a, a very similar formula, but the, the key factor there is that there's an engine displacement aspect of this. Um, so theoretically then what you would do is you would divide both of these numbers by two, you'd come out about the same. Uh, and there's other ways to do this too. You know, there's, there's global multipliers for these transients that you could apply instead um, if, if you feel better about that. Um, there's, there's a lot of different multipliers that factor into this stuff, but you could, you know, theoretically mess with any number of those. But uh, by making that particular change, uh, this should also allow your, your transients to stay, you know, for the most part, where they were before without doing anything else. So, uh, Chris, I hope that helps, man. Um, one last comment I will say is if any of you guys actually use uh, EEC Analyzer, in combination with binary editor, which is a pretty popular uh, combo. Uh, I, ju I just want to bring this to your attention. If any of you guys ever get curious and you look at this horsepower torque simulation, um, this is where you, you basically feed it a data log where you go wide open throttle. And uh, then it basically, based on a, some math, it, it sort of guesstimates what your, uh, your horsepower and torque is. You know, how accurate this is, I don't know. I've, I've never really sat down and put this on a dyno where I look at these numbers and then an actual dyno sheet, and, you know, I don't really care. But what, what numbers like this might help you do, just like being on a dyno, is it's less about what's the number. It's more about when I make tuning changes and then do it again, did different areas go up or did they go down? So in that regard, this can be kind of a nifty tool when you're doing street tuning that you might want to look at and see if your changes are increasing or, or decreasing the... Uh, theoretical torque that's listed here. But anyways, the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is if you have any old data logs that you were doing running before you did this scaling, and then you do the scaling and you come back here and run these again, these numbers are going to be off. Uh, they're going to be cut down by the same factor you uh, you cut down your mass error data. So if you cut all that stuff in half, your, your horsepower and torque measurements here are also going to be cut in half. So uh, again, don't, don't get caught up with numbers, guys. Just... Uh, Use it as a tuning tool. That's what it is. Dinos, sheets like this, it's tuning tools. So, all right, Chris, good luck. Godspeed, man.